problem, quote unquote problem, um, to be process oriented. Um, it's not that we're gonna fix something, it's that we're gonna make life better for people in some way. And that simple shift in perspective opens us up to the next stage, which is ideation. Uh, in the ideation stage, we generate a lot of ideas quickly and nothing is off limits. So that's like brainstorming. Um, and then we move into prototyping. We experiment, we develop a new model, we do it quickly. Um, we try to do it if it's a tangible thing, like really scaled down. And we don't spend a lot of time on the details. We just want to see if it's going to work. And um, then we test it out. And we do that quickly also. We might find that it doesn't work so well. Uh, we might discover we were off base about what the problem or the need actually was. And so um, that's okay. We're not invested in the solution at this point because we haven't put that much time or energy into it. Remember the sunk cost bias from earlier? If we haven't already put in a lot of time and energy, we haven't invested a bunch, it's going to be easier for us to let go of those ideas. And so that ties back in then with that whole idea of being able to change your mind. Um, it's okay. It's okay to change your mind. Sometimes things don't work. Um, so we go back. And the thing about design thinking, which is really fascinating, is that it's, um, it's an iterative process. So um, it, we just keep going back until we have something that is a, is a good solution for us. Um, so the real key is with design thinking and how it applies to leadership and advocacy. It, we cannot be so committed to our ideas that we fail to see the opportunities in other ideas. If we hold our ideas just a bit more loosely, it's healthier for us because then we don't get offended. We don't get dejected or demoralized as easily than if we have tightly wound our identity in with our idea. And that's healthier for those we're serving or connecting with because we can engage them in this design process. Um, because after all, we're designing for them, right? We're not doing it for us. It's that servant perspective. Um, and a great tool that I have found to be super helpful for getting myself kind of out of that linear, reductive, oppositional sort of thinking and into that more divergent, opportunity-seeking, open thinking is a, a little tool called Yes And. And you might have seen this before because a lot of comedy groups, like improv comedy groups, use it um, as a way to just create, right? Um, and it really does open you up to the unexpected. So a very natural response to a new idea, uh, whether it's your own or someone else's, is to think of all the ways that it won't work. Um, we yeah, but ideas to death, honestly, in a lot of ways. And so in this, in the ide ideation stage, especially, the yes and tool can help us generate unlimited ideas. So when we have a brainstorm, we resist that yeah, but. And instead, we say yes and, and see how we can build on that initial idea. How can we grow that and change it? And that doesn't mean that we're going to stick with it. It's just an opportunity. It opens us up to possibility. Okay, so finally, the last tool that I want to share with you is uh, self-care. And self-care is a pretty loaded word, I, I will admit. Um, I think it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, especially in our like consumer driven American culture, uh, it might suggest that you have to go buy something or at the very least uh, take time away, uh, make an investment in yourself. There's lots of stuff out there about that. Um, and then we kind of shame people for not doing it, um, which is I, I think kind of weird, but we, but we do it, right? Um, I've even noticed, I was sharing with my CMTE group this morning, the, uh, there's been a meme going around during the, during the uh, stay-at-home orders and stuff that if you don't come out of this having learned a new skill or something like that then shame on you I mean I, it doesn't say shame on you but that's the tone um, and I saw that and I was I was horrified by that because I'm gonna tell you the way my life is there's no way I'm coming out of this with a new skill um, I'm doing the best I can just to you know keep people on track <laughs> um, and I think that when when we can kind of let go of thinking of self-care as like extra stuff or, um, you know, something we have to buy um, or devote a lot of energy to, I think that helps us be able to do it more effectively. Um, and also just recognize that sometimes what we're already doing is self-care. Uh, there's this great quote from Brianna Weist. She says, true self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It's making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape. And truly a lot of self-care is kind of escapism, yeah. Um, 
I think we could alter her words just a bit here too, because not everybody has the luxury to build a life that you don't want or need to escape. I think that's a reality for a lot of people. Uh, sometimes the reality of the moment is pretty crappy, uh, maybe even dangerous. And in those situations, escape may be necessary, um, either physically or mentally. Um, but that aside, if when we look at self-care, it can really look a lot different. Uh, it might be sending the um, sending an email that's been nagging you or checking something off of your to-do list. Uh, you might be pausing to recognize how somebody else's words just made you feel before you respond. That's self-care. Uh, it might be foregoing your daily stop at your favorite coffee shop um, so you can save up for something that you're looking forward to. It might be arranging your workspace so that it brings you joy or peace. Uh, it might be harder, like establishing a boundary or reinforcing a boundary, uh, either with somebody else or with yourself. Um, it might include tuning into one of your unmet needs and finding a way to meet that need. It could be a brief gratitude practice or simply identifying something you do have control over in a moment. Or it might be savoring a moment of joy. I have recently been introduced to the work of Ingrid Fatel Lee. Uh, she is a designer and she has done some work on the aesthetics of joy. I was really struck by something she said, and her name will be up here on the screen in just a second. Um, but I was really struck by something she said about the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is measured over time and is an appraisal of how good our life is. But that's really complicated because we don't always know if we really are happy. Um, we tend to tie it to life events, uh, which actually makes happiness a bit more elusive because those life events tend to have a lot of factors outside of our own control. Graduation, anyone? <laughs> uh, I think that might be something going on with some of you at this point, like you may not have a ceremony. Who knows? Um, so if we're tying happiness to those big events like that, um, that, that can make it so that we don't I mean, we, don't, we may not even experience it. Um, joy, on the other hand, is simpler. It's more immediate. It tends to be a bit easier because it's a visceral body experience. And we always know when we have one of those moments. And what's even better is that we can actually create those moments. We can curate those moments for ourselves too. Um, so Ingrid is a designer and she's very interested in the aesthetics of joy. Um, those things that connect the physical world around us uh, with the emotional world within us. And so I'm going to just flash them up on the screen. But we find joy in things like uh, abundance, harmony, energy, freedom, surprise, transcendence, magic, renewal, celebration, and play. And when we find those moments, we get that joyful feeling. Um, that actually helps us create a more joyful existence overall, uh, noticing those moments. Because we won't always have them, um, so we really savor them when we do. So I think a really important thing you can do as a leader is to not only demonstrate self-care, but make it possible for those you serve. Reduce or eliminate the barriers, including the barrier of shame. It is really strongly connected to compassion in that sense, caring for others in such a way that they're empowered to their own self-care. And I think this is crucial in advocacy work as well. And compassion is truly amazing because it's a resource that doesn't run dry for us. Uh, we sometimes can have more difficulty accessing it, uh, but once we tap into it, it's, re it's really limitless. Um, and the best way for us to tap into compassion is to practice self-compassion. Self-compassion is, uh, as researched and described by Kristen Neff, has three components, mindfulness, common humanity, and loving kindness. So to just wrap up my, my remarks, I would like to ask you to join me in a brief self-compassion practice now. So if you would like, you can close your eyes or just soften your gaze so you focus inward for a moment and bring to mind a situation that is difficult in some way for you, that might be causing you some stress. And then scan your body. Just notice where and how you are experiencing that stress and emotional discomfort in your body. And now say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. That is mindfulness. Noticing and acknowledging without judging yourself or the stress. And next, say to yourself, suffering is a part of life. That's common humanity. 
You can also think of it as other people feel this way. We all struggle at times, or I'm not alone. And now I'll invite you, if you'd like, you can rub your hands together just to warm them up some, uh, and then put your hands over your heart. Just feel the warmth of your hands, the gentle touch of your hands on your chest. Or if somewhere else in your body could use that soothing touch, go ahead and do that. Maybe it's your forehead or your neck or shoulders. Maybe you feel like you really just need a hug. You can give yourself that hug. And then say to yourself, may I be kind to myself. You can also ask, what do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? Perhaps you can identify with one of these phrases. May I learn to accept myself as I am. May I be strong. May I be patient. And this is the piece of loving kindness toward ourselves. And as you're ready, just take a deep breath, release that breath and open your eyes. So I hope that what I've shared with you today will inspire you to leadership and advocacy. It's not an easy journey, um, but it is also not an impossible one. So I encourage you to step outside of your comfort zone, speak up in support of those who are overlooked. Lead as a servant to the world around you, because it just may be that you are the one you have been waiting for. Thank you. So I'll, I'll um, be happy to take questions for a few moments, if anyone has any. Oh, and I'll look back over the comments here too. Sunk cost bias. Um, yep, Sam answered it, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, there's some great reading out there about bias. It's fascinating, love it. And it also makes you really like question yourself, <laughs> which is not always a bad thing. <laughs> I don't see any questions popping in there, but we can wait a moment. You know, it's that weird artificial environment of Zoom that, you know, you don't really know if anyone's asking a question yet. Thank you, Kara. I like those tools too. Uh, websites are further reading on design thinking. Yes, um, I have read a lot because <laughs> I am really fascinated by design thinking. I've been looking at applications of it in a lot of different ways. Um, IDEO, I think it's .com. Um, they are kind of a design firm that uh, help to conceptualize some of the tools of design thinking. Thank you, Jordan, for typing that in. Um, you guys are like the best moderators. I might be looking for some good volunteers for the national conference. Um, yes, and Amanda Bryant uh, did a session yesterday in the conference on design thinking. She did two, actually. Uh, she had a 1.0 and a 2.0, and um, you can go back and access if you were registered for that. Um, she's got some really good uh, like a specific application to music therapy practice, I think, in, in her work. Um, there are, I mean, if you just Google design thinking, you can really go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Lots of resources out there. And if you, if you're like totally overwhelmed by it and you really want a good list from me, I'm happy to put that together. Just send me an email. And I would love to hear from you. Love to hear from anybody. I could flash my email up here. I actually, I put it on a slide. I just didn't share it. Um, there you go. Um, you're welcome to contact me. I'm happy to answer questions. Have virtual coffee. You know, I'm getting pretty good with Zoom, so. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan, for putting it in the chat. All right. <laughs>